This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. Our troubled world is fractured by cultures and divided by borders. But when tragedy strikes, courage and love know no boundaries. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, in a special international episode of Rescue 911, true stories of heroes who remind us that despite our differences, people the world over share a passionate commitment to preserving life. We begin in Normandy, France, late on the afternoon of August 3rd, 1976, as members of a local skydiving club gathered at the Cannes Carpiquet Airport. That day, three parachutists, including Nicole Gaydon, who were planning to do a tandem jump known as a star, which they had performed many times before, Lucien Levallois was director of the local skydiving center. I knew Nicole very well because I had seen her on her arrival at the school. She had never seen a parachute in her life, so I had the pleasure to teach her everything you had to do on the first jump. At this time, she had to have done close to a thousand jumps. Claude Trechamp was the pilot that day. At the time, there was a great deal of spirit in the club. Everybody would know one another, and it was an atmosphere where everybody would trust one another. We were flying the last flight of the day. Nicole was making her third jump of this type that day. There was nothing special about it. This jump, on the contrary, was a relaxed jump with friends. Claude dropped two solo jumpers first, before climbing to 6,500 feet to drop Nicole's group. When exiting the plane, they wanted to save time, so they uh, bunched together as closely as possible. And Miss Guédon was sitting in the doorway from where she would uh, jump first, and the two others held onto her shoulders from behind. The more the minutes passed, the more uncomfortable Nicole's situation became. We didn't know whether she was conscious or not, and in need of care that we couldn't give her. Three parachutists making a tandem jump near a small airport in Normandy, France, had leapt from the plane at 6,500 feet as Lucien Levallois, director of the skydiving center, looked on. I had a pair of binoculars which enabled me to follow the jumps. My first surprise was to see only two parachutists leaving the plane. Look, 
It wasn't too hard to know who was there. The color of her jumpsuit allowed me immediately to identify Nicole. She was held prisoner by a hook that's next to the door, which was normally used to pull parachutes open automatically for the beginning students. I couldn't pull on her very, very, very strongly in this manner, because even though a plane can fly very well by itself, as soon as she was swinging from side to side, the plane would swerve, and I was obliged to get hold of the control stick. I thought that uh, by swinging the plane, I could have enabled her to uh, jump off from her spot. When the skydiver landed, his first worry was to quickly come and warn us, to tell us, watch out, I may have hurt Nicole while passing her, and she may not be able to open her parachute. Her body hit the bottom of the plane, making a tremendous noise. And so I had to ask myself if I was running the risk of hurting her. I saw her gestures and then her eyes, which were saying, no, I can't do it anymore, let me fall. Down below, Lucien was trying to figure out if the pilot could simply cut the strap and let Nicole parachute to the ground. It was difficult for us to know what would happen next, because we didn't know what part of the harness he had to cut. It could cause Nicole to slip through it. And above all, we didn't have enough information about the ability Nicole still had at that time to open the parachute. The control tower told me to land on the glass runway. I yelled negative because her head, as far as I could tell, was lower than the wheel. So if I had bounced a little bit, the poor woman would have crushed her skull. I was thinking about the water, since there's the canal that runs by Caen and then goes to the sea. On water, we had a chance. A drop-off in the canal appeared to be very dangerous, given the narrowness of the canal. And since the sea was seven and a half miles away from the skydiving center, by plane it could be very quickly reached. Me? I said, fine, it's the same thing, since water is the same everywhere. But in addition, at sea, there were rescuers, as well as frogmen who would be able to recover her. The Louis Trion police were notified to send rescue boats to a designated drop-off point. Nicole had now been hanging upside down in near-freezing temperatures for more than 30 minutes. One of the instructors was strongly opposed, thinking that it's the same. Whether you dropped her on the concrete runway or on the water, the result would be the same. I had to really ask myself whether she was in good shape or not. In the beginning, she was touching the inside when it was her complete hand. After that, it was only her fingertips. But then after that, nothing was touching. Claude spotted a helicopter and radioed for assistance. The Department of Public Safety arranged to provide the chopper and two scuba divers to help with Nicole's rescue. I wanted to try to cut the strap to see if it would cut easily. Eh? 
j'ai eu la trouille. I was really afraid. I was over the land and rather high up. I had never thought that a strap like that could have been cut so easily. The more the minutes passed, the more uncomfortable Nicole's situation became. We didn't know whether she was conscious or not, and in need of care that we couldn't give her. By eight in the evening, everyone had arrived at the drop-off point. I couldn't go any slower. 55, 60 miles an hour, a plane needs a certain speed to be able to stay airborne. I was not high, that's all I can say. The divers told me 18, 24 feet. We knew that the pilot was safe. Already that was a good thing. But we didn't know at all how Nicole was, and we had to wait for minutes which were very, very long. The divers told us a story that they came with their big knife and everything to try to cut the parachute. She started to yell, saying, no, no, don't cut it, it's not worth it, because uh, the parachute is very expensive. All of a sudden, they told us everything had gone well. Obviously, it was a great relief for us. Of course. Everybody did what they had to do. And then there was also a little bit of luck, probably, for me. For me. It was champagne for everyone, in the good French tradition. Miraculously, Nicole Gaydon suffered only minor bruises in the incident. It was tiring for me, but the more time went by, the more I was thinking that something was going to happen. What we couldn't do up in the air, both of us, other people were taking care of it, and I trusted them. It's entirely possible that someone less poised than Nicole under the plane would have pulled on the handle that opens one of the two parachutes, which obviously would have been catastrophic. Within two weeks, Nicole was skydiving again. Seventeen years later, she has completed more than 3,000 jumps and is an instructor at the skydiving center. They certainly listen to her, because, understandably, this incident is still talked about today. It was a difficult time, but since everything turned out okay, it's actually a good memory to have saved someone. It's not bad, you know. Next. I was more and more scared. They didn't have special equipment. They needed to have to go in the cave. On July 13th, 1991, some friends set out to explore an underwater cave in the jungles of Corimagua, Venezuela. But the map they had of the many chambers inside the cave was incomplete, leaving some unanswered mysteries which they hoped to solve. The expedition was led by 32-year-old Gustavo Badillo. Gustavo's fiancée, Maria Elena Mendoza, had also come along. I was never too happy about the idea. I had my 
second thoughts about going to a cave. And I didn't like the jungle. But Gustavo said, I won't go if you're not going. So I said, OK. Their destination was located deep inside the rainforest, so they did not arrive until just before nightfall. Park ranger Asmel Palencia had been hired to guide them to the place called Acarite. The truth is, I was afraid because I've never entered into that cave. There are stories where they say he who enters that cave gets lost, never to come out again. Gustavo planned to dive with his friend Eduardo Wallace, although neither of them had been trained for cave diving. Before going to the cave, we went over the original map that we had. We were not concerned about any danger. I was more and more scared. They had the suits, the mask, but they didn't have special equipment. They needed to have to go in the cave. So I said, well, then take this prayer and keep it with you. We didn't have a cave dive reel, but we had different kind of ropes on the map. There was a passage with a question on it that nobody has gone through. We just wanted to go in there and to see how far we could get. The entrance to the first passage was about 30 feet below the surface. At the beginning, it was pretty much clear. But this mud from the rock was coming off. So behind us, the visibility was turning into zero. much more complex than we thought at the beginning. I got to a place where there was a big chamber. I heard Gustavo coming out from the water, but I could not see him. We talked through the walls. And I said that we better go back, because if we continue to go into the cave, we were not going to be so sure which was the way out. I was swimming toward what I thought was the entrance. I found myself in a dead end. I finally realized that I was lost. I was desperately looking for a place with more air. I didn't think about Gustavo at that moment. After a while, I thought uh, a big chamber. And I knew that I was outside. I said, why are you asking me if Gustavo's here? Gustavo is with you. And he says, no, we got lost at the entrance. 
I was shocked. So I said, you go back and find him. Because he must be right there. Gustavo had all the ropes. So we made a line, probably in between 10 and 15 feet. Ricardo hold one end, and I hold the other. And I went below as long as the rope let me go. We waited like 10 minutes. Eduardo comes back again, and for my surprise, he said, it's too murky. The water is almost mud, and I cannot find the entrance. And I said, this is the end of it, you know. It's like, like a switch. I was turned off. M my life just stopped right there in that moment. He's going to die, and I can do nothing from here. They went in with a tank of oxygen to make noise under the water to see if Gustavo could hear the noise and find his way out. But Gustavo didn't come out. By that time, it was too dark to leave. We sat there and nobody said a word until the sun came out. Every minute that went on was uh, a minute against his life. And the bottom of my heart, I thought that he was, he was gone. When we continue, now we're into almost 36 hours that the man's missing. We thought that it was completely unrealistic that he would be alive. While diving in an underwater cave in the jungles of Venezuela, Gustavo Badillo became lost somewhere deep below the surface. As soon as it was light the next morning, his friends drove to the nearest town and called everyone they could think of for help, including the owner of the dive shop where Gustavo worked. Hello. I had Hello, some experience yes. in cave diving, but I've never done a rescue. I just wasn't trained to do it. So right away, I called a friend of ours in Florida. Oh. I knew that if anybody was the person to do it, was Steve. Steve Gerard is one of the most experienced cave divers in the United oh. States. This is Vivian Andriago calling from Caracas, Venezuela. We had a she wanted me to come down uh, immediately to help find him. I can come down if you want me to. I had no idea where in Venezuela that it was located. Um, there's a lot involved in getting ready to go down to, uh, to where you are. A friend of Gustavo's, Leo Caligaro, who had done some cave diving, heard of the accident and flew in to make a rescue attempt of his own. When I saw him, I hugged Leo and started crying, because for me, it was my last hope. He was a friend, but he was also a human being. I had to do something for him. By this time, it had been more than 24 hours since Gustavo first entered the cave. By and by, they came back out. They said they cannot enter. They didn't have the right equipment, and they didn't want to make the same mistake. When I came out, everyone was upset. Everyone. I told Maria Elena it's best if you leave, because tomorrow when they come, they may pull out a corpse. So I took all Gustavo's belongings. I left his jacket, because it's going to be very cold, and his chocolate bar. He always have one after he dies. I said, this is it. You know, it's over. Yeah. 
It's very rare to find anyone alive in the Cape. We've had over 325 fatalities in Florida alone. Steve had convinced his friend, John Orlowski, a specialist in diving river caves like Acarite, to go with him to South America. Well, if he's been in 50 degree water for that length of time, you have to realize he's hypothermic and probably dead. In my mind, I was going to Venezuela do a body recovery. The trip from Florida was 1,500 miles by air and land. By the time Steve and John arrived at the cave, it was 7 o'clock on the morning of the third day. My friends and I, we moved as fast as possible to help them get the equipment down. We didn't know whether to cry or laugh or what, because we felt that salvation had come. The one last thing I said to the crowd was, well, let's hope for a happy ending. Okay. But now we're into almost 36 hours that the man's missing. We thought that it was completely unrealistic that he would be alive. I just was convinced this is ludicrous. I mean, who in their right mind would want to die in this type of cave? You couldn't see anything. You could barely see your hand in front of your face. We could have been inches away. We could have passed the body six times and never even seen it. Steve said at that point, I'm going to just sit here for about two hours and go out and tell them we're going to find them. <laughs> because we're not going to find them in this. But it was like, okay, we're here. We have a job to do. Let's get it done and get the hell out of here. I felt like I had made a left-hand turn. You can't see, so you know, it's just a feeling you have. And I saw a light flashing. And I went, oh, you dumb shit. You just swim around in a circle, and you're coming right back up on Steve. So I popped my head up, and I said, yeah, Steve, what? All I see is this person stumbling towards me. Okay. You okay. At that point, the victim had already grabbed me and was hugging me. Okay. See? He was realizing that this was not a dream. <laughs> we started doing a lot of high-fiving, and it was like, I can't believe it. <sighs> He's alive. One of them came out. I don't remember who it was. I let out a scream that was heard, I'm sure, several kilometers away. I felt at that moment so incredibly happy. Super feliz. I'll never forget that moment long. It was just. It was like from a movie, you know, seeing that. Apparently, Gustavo had gotten tangled in the guide rope and became disoriented while trying to free himself. I kept swimming through different passages. I was thinking, why is this happening to me? my legs. It was difficult to swim because they would fall asleep from the cold. What I wanted was to get out of the water, but the walls wouldn't let me. Time passed. I'm not sure how much. 
I practically couldn't feel my body. I saw the water, how it turned white. I thought the angels have come for me. And I said, oh my God, heaven is English and the angels are English. Gustavo and Eduardo did a foolish thing. They went to this cave without having the right equipment or, or really knowing to, how to do it correctly. In this particular case, they were extremely lucky. Gustavo Badillo was treated for exposure and dehydration and released from the hospital that same day. One year later, he and Maria Elena were married. I have problems with Maria Elena because she suffered a lot with this. And she's very much afraid of all my expeditions. Gustavo likes to go to the mountains, to the beach, motorcycle rides. Many places that I've never been because I've been very city type person. But I love him a lot. He loves my son, and as long as I can and God gives us life, I hope we'll be together. Gustavo! Hey. Gustavo plans to return one day to explore the mysteries of Acarite, but only after becoming certified in cave diving. Anyone that wants to go there, we have to tell them how dangerous that adventure could be. I think there is doses of inexperience in all this. It's good to be brave, but it's good to, to think about what you're doing. <laughs> that Steve and John would come down from the United States and want to rescue me without even knowing me. I think that that's a true miracle. Thank God the angels came and they saved me. Next, Christian and Daniel, we all were frightened because we couldn't help him. Europe was already frozen to the ice. On April 4th, 1991, near Zermatt, Switzerland, Daniel Weber and a group of friends set out to ski the magnificent mountain glaciers in that area of the Alps. All six were experienced skiers who respected the dangerous beauty of the slopes, but felt prepared for the challenge that awaited them. When you go ski touring, you walk very slow, so you have time to see all the areas and the mountains. It's a very spectacular view, but we plan always to ski very carefully. You have to take care about all the crevasses. This is the, the dangerous thing on glaciers. You can fall in. Leading the group of skiers that day was Christian Brunner. I was the link between, on the one side, the group of volleyball player friends, Jörg and Jens, and on the other hand, I had a group of my mountaineering friends, Daniel, Marcus and Tom. The weather was nice and clear, the sun was shining, we could enjoy the sights, the view. It was a wonderful feeling, especially for Jens and York, because it was the first time that they had been on the top of a mountain that was 13,000 feet high. On top we had a little meal, looked around the area and enjoyed all of this. And before we skied down, there was a bigger group with a mountain guide, and they also started skiing down. If you go down from the mountain, in this case, it's just one way, and it's the trail you went up. And because Jörg and Jens, this was the first time skiing down a glacier, and so we told them to stay on the trail because there you can be more sure that under the trail is no crevasses. Hey, Dirk! Jens! 
Der Jörg ist in der Gletscherspalte gefallen. I thought it's about five meters deep, not more. So we thought, you know, okay, it's no problem. But we looked into the hole and it was so deep and it was a, a shock. We thought maybe he's dead. The expert mountaineers had brought ice climbing gear in case of an emergency. While they tried to reach Jorg, someone else skied to the group ahead and told their guide what had happened. The guide radioed the Air Zermatt rescue team, and a helicopter was dispatched to the scene. If a person is exposed to freezing temperature, that means that the temperature of the body will sink to a dangerous degree. And if it reaches that degree for any length of time, then that means that the heart and the body functions will simply stop. I knew it was a race against time, and every minute felt like, uh, like an hour. Christian! Christian, come out runter! And nachlassen. Und langsam, jawohl, so ist gut. Danny, komm. Jens Olhofer lowered two friends into the crack in the glacier. I was scared. Christian and Daniel, we all were frightened. We realized we would have big problems to get him up by ourselves. At first, when I saw him, I saw that it's serious because we couldn't help him. Jörg was already frozen into the ice. I had a picture in my mind seeing Jörg's mother and I told myself that I could no longer look into her eyes if I didn't bring her son back to her. It took half an hour for them to get to Jörg. Although he was lodged 75 feet below the surface, he was still alive. In that moment came by me a panic off. At that moment, I slightly panicked, because I didn't see any way of getting him out of there. He was really trapped. He told me, I can't breathe, I'm so squeezed in, I can't get any air. It was frustrating for me, because we could just talk with Jörg and not help more. And Jörg actually talked about dying. Because the crevasse was rounded, he couldn't see the sky, nothing. It was just ice, snow. Always the feeling of this pressure. Because of strong winds, it took the helicopter more than an hour to reach the scene. Among those who responded was Alpine ski guide Kurt Lauber. You have to be really lucky that you can survive if you fell into a crevasse. I don't know, maybe it goes 50 to 50 percent that you survive or that you die. Even if you fall a couple of feet, you can die. And we had no idea how far it, it was down. Now the help is here. Christian went up to the top. He felt that he couldn't stay any longer in there. But he also told to hurry up. No, Jörg, it's not going to go. Jörg, hold it out. Jörg's friends, they, they went calm and they tried to help Jörg. Not like some other people who freaked out completely. There was a time when Jörg talked about giving up. He said, I must go to sleep. I'm feeling faint. There's no sense in struggling on. I'm never going to get out of here. And then Daniel shouted down, Come on, Jörg, behave yourself. You can't go to sleep. You must fight. We was working with a small ice axe because 
as long as he sees that something is going on, because he's not so afraid. <laughs> The first thing what I thought was that we need to have an air hammer because there was no way, no chance to, to get him out without the air hammer because his hands, his boots and also his skis, they went stalked into the ice. By the time an air hammer arrived at the accident scene, Jorg had been trapped for more than two hours. With the air hammers, they could break out big pieces of ice. They worked slowly, but they had to do it very safe. They were being as careful as possible. Jorg had been pinned between the walls of ice for nearly five hours, when rescuers finally freed him enough so that they could try to lift him out. Jörg told us that he's not feeling his legs, so we thought maybe his back is broken, and uh, if you are not really careful, they may be paralyzed afterwards. Jörg was fast like a He had the ganz. Jörg was almost as pale as death. His lips were a deep purple, his eyes half closed. The freezing was taking its toll. Hypothermia was near. Emergency medicine specialist Dr. Axel Mann had been flown in to treat Jörg as soon as he reached the surface. In the last half hour that he was in the crevasse, he almost lost his consciousness. That meant that we had to assume that his body temperature had fallen way down below the critical point of 80 degrees. That meant that there was an absolute danger of your losing his life. We could feel the relief of all the people, including the rescue team. He was out there and he was alive. It's like being reborn. It's like second life. Jörg was transported to a hospital in Visp for treatment. He was released after three days with no lasting effects. It is only due to the mountain guides and my friends, like Christian and Daniel, that I am still alive. They constantly encouraged me. They tried to tell me to overcome the situation. They inspired me not to give up. They actually risked their lives for me. So I am certain that without these people, I wouldn't be here today. I would not have survived. If you go mountaineering, the teamwork is very important. So, for me it's normal if you go to the mountains together, then you help together. And for us it was just the right thing to do when we were down there. We had no thoughts about being heroes or something like this. It was just the right way. And afterwards, I feel like Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Man sollte yeah, just because an accident like this one happened, one shouldn't now have the feeling or impression that it's very risky to go on ski tours and to ski in the free nature. All in all, a ski tour is surely still less dangerous than driving a car. So, we're certain to go skiing together again and, and we'll try to have a beautiful day together <laughs> without any accidents. The greatest gift people the world over can share is compassion for others and a commitment to help those in need. This series is dedicated to all the men, women, and children around the world 
who choose to get involved when a life is at stake. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next time for more true stories on Rescue 911.